Welcome back, Christians. We are here for part two of Stonewall 50 Years of Protest. Um, if you have not had a chance, you need to go back and listen to the first episode. Um, we're Now we're going to actually get into the night of the event, the days leading right up to it and the night. Make sure you listen to part one because you will... I mean, you'll you'll understand what's going on, but you want to hear the whole story. Exactly. You, you can't hear half the you story. You want to get the full context of what's happening. Why was this, I mean, of all the raids and all the joint, gin joints in all the world, that's a Casablanca reference, of all the raids that had happened, why was this the raid that made a difference? I mean, it was just happening nonstop, but this was a night. I wonder um, why. What, what could have been so different? If you didn't listen to episode one, you'll never know. You'll never know. So go back, listen to episode one, but we're going to get it moving. We're not even going to... Not even going to talk about other things. We're going to Because you know what? We caught up on the last episode. Listen to it if you yeah. want to know everything you need to know. If you want to know what's going on in our lives and you like our little banter back and forth. But this episode, it's all about Stonewall all the time. Which, by the way, every time I Googled Stonewall, I had to wade through articles about Stonewall Jackson. Why do people still fucking care about Stonewall Jackson? So you know what you need to do? You need to link to this our website so that way when people search Stonewall our website shows up as the number one result exactly exactly and you know how you do that rate us a five on iTunes or actually podcast because iTunes is dead retweet our pinned tweet about Stonewall that's right everything helps repeat sh- retweet share educate your friends and let's get into Stonewall when we last left off on our episode we had Fat Tony had purchased the Stonewall in and turned it from a hotel into a thriving bar, bringing in around twelve thousand dollars a weekend, weekend equivalent to thirty five thousand dollars a day, or thirty five thousand dollars a day. I still can't talk. So he's making thirty five thousand dollars a weekend on this bar. That's huge. That's a good chunk of change. It is a good chunk Most of change. Most people make that. I mean, most people who are... That's like someone's salary in a year. Exactly. That's a teacher's salary and Mm -hmm. today's money, which is sad. So he's making Buku's money. And we left off and Sylvia and Marsha were meeting up on June 28th to celebrate Marsha's birthday. She was born in June like every good queer is. Except for Paul, who was born on July 5th. Which is the best birthday, if I might add. I get fireworks celebrating my life every single year. Do you get fireworks celebrating your life? I don't think so. I have flag day, so I get to celebrate our country's flag, which is very important. Good for you. (laughs) So just a few weeks earlier, Inspector Seymour Pine of the NYPD Moral Sector received news of suspicious sales in European bonds. He and Detective Charles Smith began to investigate the matter, which eventually led them to Greenwich Village. Which... Um, we're about to tell you why, but it also, if you listen in the first half, we talked about how the mob was, you know, so they would, they had a capital on these bars and, um, for a long time, you could only have a gay bar if you went through the mob and the mafia. A lot of places were still going through the mob and the mafia because they had protection from the police when they went to these bars, which is why people of color preferred the mafia bars over to the, the, uh, the white owned bars. Um, and so what Inspector Pine does is he goes through and he, we talked about how gay men, but what the, back up, I'm all jumbled. So the whole point of that was though, but another way that the mob would capitalize on our disadvantaged community is that they would see gay men in the bars or lesbians in the bars. And then if they found out that they weren't out or if they had family, they were trying to keep their orientation a secret, they would blackmail them. So, of course, this started to arouse suspicion because all of a sudden these there's all this money that's being exchanged and people want to know why. Mm-hmm. So the investigators believed the bonds had been stolen by homosexuals who were being blackmailed by the mafia in need of a way to cov- covertly pay them off. The best way the detectives knew to lock down a homosexual was to catch them at a gay bar. So the raids on the Greenwich Village bars began. The investigators were successful in shutting down several local bars, such as the Snake Pit and the Sewer. And while they were met, and while they were met with some verbal protests, there was no other interference. On June 23rd, Pine led a small, uneventful raid on the Stonewall Inn, which procured him s- several employees as well as some useful documents that would prove the Stonewall wasn't a bottle club. Again, in our first episode, we talk about how Fat Tony, the owner of the Stonewall Inn, had found a way around the liquor laws 
um, which up until 1998 prohibited the sale of alcohol to sex deviants. And so he called his bar a bottle club, which was a, which fell under different laws. And so Pine thought, you know what, I can, I can close this place down if I can prove that it's not a bottle club. It's just a regular old fucking bar. This evidence would aid in getting the inn closed down for good. While Pine was actually sympathetic to the queer community, he took his orders without question like any other police commander. His objective was to close down the gay bars, reduce the mafia's targets for blackmail, and thus eliminate the need for theft of bonds. And I'm not trying to paint Pine in like a sympathetic light, but I'm just saying <clears throat> you had a lot of people that were openly bigoted towards the queer community. And for Pine, that wasn't what it was about, but he also wasn't going to let that stop him from doing his job. You know, if, if closing down gay bars is what he needed to do to get to his objective, that's what he was going to do. Um, but the part of the plan that wasn't thought through was how these constant and incessant raids would affect the queer community. So as tensions mounted in the ensuing weeks and days leading up to the riots, police forces only fanned the flames of anger. Lily Law was in full effect. Lily Law was a term coined in response to police abuse of the LGBTQ community. The street queens devised code words to alert others of law enforcement. Lily Law, Betty Badge, and Patty Pig were the most common. This was w this way one queen could call out to the other, Here comes Lillian, or Lily is on the way, without arousing police suspicion. And in June of 1969, Lillian, Betty, and Patty were on every street corner, every alleyway, and every side road, testing the patience of the strained queer community. But with all the constant patrols and police harassment, Lily Law couldn't be bothered to step in to help a queer in need. Just two weeks before the riots, a group of straight vigilantes had taken axes and saws and leveled a local park known for gay cruising. It's the act of scouting for another homosexual and hooking up. It's tender before tender. Because landlords were legally allowed to evict someone for being gay, and because many queer men had few other options, public parks were often turned into hookup spots. The homophobic citizens destroyed the park, chased the queer hiding queers out, and beat anyone they could catch. The police sat off to the side, watching this all unfold, and doing nothing to aid the distraught gay men. Which, this... The need for that was literally caused by the people who destroyed the park. Exactly. If they literally just let people be themselves, they wouldn't have to do anything. They it, wouldn't have to sneak around. They could just do it in the fucking yeah. privacy of their homes like everybody else. Yeah, if you didn't have a stupid these stupid laws, if you didn't, if people couldn't be evicted just for having sex with who they wanted to have sex with, you're right. They wouldn't need to be going in the park. And how fucking extreme to they be so angry park. that you leveled an entire park. Park. That's so much work. Have that's you our cut next, down a tree before? <laughs> that's our next protest. We're gonna level a park. We're gonna fucking. We're gonna release all the. I'm animals. not gonna make it because I'm gonna get halfway through a tree and I'm gonna be like, no, I'm done. I'm just gonna be <laughs> doing the branches. <laughs> like, all right. That's why we have the lesbians. They can gut the trees with the axe. Exactly. And they'll have um, the chainsaws, and we're just standing on the side. Like, yes, yes, queen. Yes. yes. <laughs> With these events fresh on everyone's mind, the evening of June 27th carried a heavy air as the sun began to set. It had been an incredibly hot and muggy day, and tensions were officially at their highest. So when Sylvia headed to Stonewall to meet Marsha for Marsha's 25th birthday, yes, yeah, she was only 25, yep. the two women and other patrons of the jam-packed bar had just about had it with the police. Yvonne Ritter, a transgender woman, was also just starting to explore her gender identity and was actually also celebrating a birthday, her 18th, set of the bar's atmosphere when she arrived. Out of the closets and into the streets was a chant I heard a lot earlier that night. We, were, we just weren't going to take it anymore. And there's a link in our, um, like we said, we're going to be publishing our scripts online now with links and references on the bottom. And there's a uh, link that will have a uh, video interview with Yvonne, who was there that night. But with a raid on a bar just a few nights before, and no word on the mafia line that another was scheduled, employees and customers alike began to relax. Soon they were drinking, dancing, and taking in the view of the go-go dancers without a care in the world. However, Pine had accounted for the mob's tip-off, and instead recruited plainclothes officers from other precincts outside of the Christopher Street jurisdiction. So he knew that if he recruited police in the jurisdiction, they would tip off the mob. And again, this is after 
weeks of constant mm-hmm. harassment. The, all the gay bars are being shut down. They're being raided. It's it's a it wasn't normal. Like normally you'd have a raid once, you know, maybe once a month, and now you're having night after night after mm-hmm. night. So initially, the inspector planned to raid the Stonewall, obtain more evidence, confiscate all the liquor, and this time arrest one cross-dressing patron. His goal was to use this individual as evidence that the Stonewall was still allowing this illegal practice to go on in their establishment. This was a key point in Pine's plan. During the pre-raid briefing, he stressed the importance of isolating suspected cross-dressers so that the officers could examine them and make a proper selection. As for the rest of the bar's patrons, they were to be released once their IDs had been verified. I guarantee you Marsha was their ideal target. Oh, I should They're absolutely. like, let's find a woman. They weren't looking. Uh, they weren't uh, going to... They well, they didn't refer to her as a woman, but I will. They, you know, they were like, find a woman a of color who absolutely mm-hmm. does not fit in with any sort of social norm, because sh- that person will be our key evidence. I don't even know if they needed to say that. I think it was just, of course, you know, if you have to choose between the black woman or the white woman, who are you going to choose? Yeah, I mean, that on top of yeah. it alone was enough. You just knew, like, nobody was. If they chose a white woman, like who, you know, you. What are the ramifications of that? You know, if she's a cross dresser and she's she's not a woman, like she's she's just a, a man that cross dresses, um, and then what what if that person has power and comes back? Mm-hmm. You know that a black woman who you suspect of cross dressing is not going to have the power to come back and attack you, right? Because that person likely has nothing. Anyways. Exactly, they don't have power. So at around 1.30 a.m. the morning of June 28th, nine police officers stormed the Stonewall Inn, turning on the lights and barring the door. The place turned into a frenzy as people attempted to run from the officers. Yvonne headed to the bathroom, hoping she could escape through a window. While she was of legal age to drink, the the drinking age wouldn't move to 21 until many years later, she was wearing her mother, her mother's stolen... She was wearing her mother's stolen party dress. The prospect of facing her parents in feminine attire was more terrifying to the young trans woman than the prospect of arrest. Yeah, so she talks about how, like, she, you know, she snuck out that night. And she, I mean, this is very early in her exploring her gender identity. Mm-hmm. So she has the courage. It's her 18th birthday. She sneaks out. She takes her mother's dress. She was dress. ready for the night of her life. Exactly, she was so right? Excited. She's like, she's finally going to be able to go to a gay bar. She's going to be able to sit in a dress. And then she, you know, she had just been before this, she had just kind of been like, um, you know, dressing up in private. And now right. she's able to go out and do this. And, um, in, now she's about to be caught and that means she's going to be taken back home and now she's going to have to face her parents and tell them that <laughs> and, to, and and they're going to see her in her mother's dress. Paul just spilled. I had to laugh because Paul just literally went I to take even, a drink. I didn't even put it to my mouth. I literally was holding it and just <laughs> He just poured the water poured all, all over himself. <laughs> all over himself. So, so others in the bar, such as Marsha P. Johnson, were well versed in confrontations with the police and weren't running from this fight. As a few officers herded the transgender individuals, drag queens, and masculine-dressed lesbians into the back room of the bar, other officers put the rest of the patrons in a single file line towards the street door. And we keep saying, um, like, cross-dressing women, but of course, um, women, butch lesbians, or any lesbians, it, women that were dressed in men's attire were also lumped in with this. You know, you right. couldn't draw, cross-dress. As ideas... As IDs were checked and folks were released, the former Stonewall customers began to huddle outside, waiting for their friends still stuck in the bar and waiting to see what the police would do. The growing crowd attracted the attentions of passerbys. Because it was so warm out, because the village was such a vibrant night spot, and because of the many recent raids, the crowd outside the Stonewall quickly grew into a large mob of curious onlookers. Yeah, so people were leaving the Stonewall and normally you would just get out there as quick as you could. But again, why exactly we don't know. Maybe because it's warm. Maybe because people are just like, fuck this. We're so tired. Whatever it is, people aren't leaving. Mm -hmm. They're waiting outside the bar, which was not normal. Normally, you got out there as fast as you could. You booked it. But now people aren't leaving. And as this crowd grows, people that are walking by, because this Christopher Street, this area is very busy. Folks are like, huh, what's going on? And so this, this mob grows. Soon the exiting patrons, now cleared by the police, began to entertain the crowd by bowing, curtsying, 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 (laughs) waving to their pretend fans, and of course, throwing one-liners at the cops. The crowd responded with laughter and applause. 
but the playful mood quickly died when a police paddy wagon pulled up to the front to carry the patrons who had been arrested back to jail. Inside the bar, Marsha, Pant No Mind Johnson, had had enough of the police officers demanding comments and humiliating examinations of her body. David Carter, author of Stonewall, The Riots That Sparked the Gay Revolution, tells in his book how Marsha finally picked up a shot glass, threw it at a mirror, and cried, I'll have my civil rights. Later, the GAA, which stands for Gay Activist Alliance, would call this the shot glass heard around the world. Sylvia Rivera would later comment, you could feel the electricity going through people. Pine and his officers were having so much trouble with the rest with the resisting drag queens and trans women that the frustrated inspector finally threw up his hands and ordered the whole lot be taken in. Yeah, so instead of we're going to take one person for evidence, he's just like, fuck it, round them all up, throw them in the wagon. As the officers began to haul arrested queens outside and into the paddy wagon, the crowd began to boo. Craig Rodwell, a large player in future gay rights activism, had been passing along the street with his boyfriend when he stopped to observe the growing unrest. There was a feeling in the air that something was going to happen. This was different, he later said. Craig climbed up on a perch and cried out, Gay power! Trying to get a chant started. But the crowd was fixed on the unfolding events. As more people began to realize the officers were arresting all the cross-dressers, more people became angry. In the midst of these growing tensions, Pine was struck with the realization that he had arrested too many people to fit in his small paddy wagon. Now some prisoners would have to be held back in the stone wall, while as many as possible were crammed into the back of the wagon. During this confusion, two Stonewall employees, so-called, escaped. Coincidentally, they happened to be mob affiliates, and Yvonne Ritter made a break for it as well. An officer caught up with her, but when the young girl pleaded with him to let her go, that it was her birthday, for some reason the officer complied. Yeah, she got lucky. She booked it back home and she was terrified. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It was awakening for her because while she didn't stay around for the following riots, um, it was very soon after this that she was able, she was started to come out. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the prisoners weren't as lucky as Yvonne. One officer roughly grabbed a young butch lesbian named Storm De La Verre. I meant to look that up. D-E-L-A-R-V-E-R-I-E. Storm um, has more recently, uh, it was very within the last couple of years that it came to light that she was the Stonewall lesbian. If you know your history, you know the Stonewall lesbian, um, the woman who is known to throw the first punch, as they say. Um, and uh, Storm was identified. She was 93 years old when she died, and it was just a couple of years before her death that yeah. she actually came out and admitted that she was the, the Stonewall lesbian. Okay. But Storm was a popular drag king and performer at the time of the Jewel Box Review. As a biracial child of a white father and a black mother, Storm grew up in the Deep South being bullied and harassed for her mixed ethnicity. Like the other patrons of the Stonewall, she was no stranger to police brutality. But she was a proud butch and she wasn't going down without a fight. Inside the bar, officers groped Storm and her lesbian friends, manhandling man and taunting them before receiving orders to take the women outside. But that's perfectly fine for oh, yeah, men to no. sexually assault women without any sort of consent or permission. Gotta show them what a real man will do. Yeah, exactly. If they had a real man, maybe they wouldn't be in this situation. Absolutely. So we might as well teach them. That's all the church is doing with their children. They just mm -hmm. want to educate them to show you, <laughs> show your children what it's like to have a real man. A real man. Welcome to the Catholic Church where we are <laughs> saving children. Thank you, Thomas Tobin. All right, and listen to episode one if you want to know what that means. The next few scenes unfolded in a chaotic mess, and which action came first, we do not know. Sylvia was watching from the sidelines as the officers wrestled to get Storm into the paddy wagon. Marsha was throwing out witty barbs at the cops, and Craig and his boyfriend, Fred Sargent, were still trying to rouse the crowd into a chant. At some point, an officer yelled at Storm, I said, move along, faggot. Storm refused, and the officer clubbed her over the head. The crowd erupted. So there's a lot of debates of who threw the first brick, who threw the first punch. Nobody knows. Everybody's perspective is different because some one person standing across the crowd is going to see something that a person another one did. Yep, different uh, perspective. On the other side, if you've ever been in any sort at any sort of live show, you know that there's so much going on. Yeah. And amplify that by 10 and you get stonewalled. Exactly. The anger, the tension, the hot air. You're sweating. You're angry. You can only see so much. Not to mention people, people have been drinking. You. 
you're drunk exactly um and so who it, and it doesn't really matter what who did what but we do know that these three women were at the center of what happened mm-hmm. we know we that's what we know so pennies through pennies flew through the air copper coins for coppers let's pay them off people in the crowd cried sylvia picked up a bottle stormed through a punch at the officer who had clubbed her marcia screamed and grabbed a rock and the crowd ignited into a fit of rage descending onto the policemen rocking the paddy wagon back and forth and slashing the tires of the cop cars some protesters found bricks and began to hurl them amid the dozens of bottles and pennies still crashing around the officers Pine managed to get the paddy wagon away from the frenzied crowd with strict instructions that they were to drop the parishioners off and come straight back. Then he and the remaining officers barricaded themselves inside the stone wall. The inspector later said of that moment, We didn't have the manpower, and the manpower from the other side was coming like it was a real war. And that's what it was, a war. Inside the inn, the officers huddled with the remaining prisoners. The crowd in the street was creating a mass of chaos, and while it was terrifying for the police, the queer detainees were electrified. Raymond Castro recalled, You could hear screaming outside, a lot of noise from the protesters, and it was a good sound. It was a real good sound to know that, you know, you had a lot of people out there pulling for you. Raymond was a Puerto Rican gay man who had only been arrested when he returned to the Stonewall after having been released to help ID a fellow fellow friend. After re-entering, the cops had a change of mind and decided to detain him. All right, that's shit. Pine ordered the door bolted to protect his small squad while they awaited the help of reinforcements. But that action further angered the mob who felt insulted that the police were now occupying their beloved Stonewall Inn. They began to throw bricks and cobblestones at the building, shattering the glass. Then a group of men uprooted a parking meter and used it to ram a large hole through the door. They were not fucking playing. (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) Oh my god. You know what? The cops were completely in the wrong and fuck them, but could you imagine being locked inside the door? Oh (laughs) no. Yeah. No, they talk about like it was terrifying inside (laughs) because this whole mob, there's hundreds of people at this point. People some people have speculated thousands Mm -hmm. and by this point are just like be- beating on the doors, throwing bricks, men so angry that they grabbed a parking leader- meter Which I don't and know how ripped you- <laughs> it out of the ground. Which I don't know how you do that. <laughs> I don't. And I also don't know how specifically gay men do that because they, uh, no, gay I men- personally don't lift <laughs> over twenty. Pounds. Like no, I don't lift over twenty pounds. So no, the thought like- of ripping a parking meter out. No, these gay no, they're showing you like, bitch, you think you can play with us? You think that because we're gay, you think that because we're feminine, we can't do this? I'm about to show you what the fuck I can do. <laughs> Literally, their hair's up, <laughs> their <laughs> fingernails are painted, <laughs> and they're like ripping that thing out. So, um, the crowd used the uh, this opportunity, the uh, the hole in the door from the parking media meter, to throw items at the cops hiding inside. Pine used the opportunity to grab one of the protesters and drag them inside. Ironically, the protester was a straight ally who had joined in the riot after he heard the commotion on his way home. But in this moment, it didn't matter that the man was straight. The officers punched and kicked him repeatedly before putting him in handcuffs and placing him with the other prisoners. The crowd outside continued to grow and people began to run to the payphones to call their friends to come join. Jerry Hoos was one person who was notified with a phone call. He said of the conversation... I had been waiting for this to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I was the happiest person on the face of the earth. I think there were tears of joy. Everybody was angry. We were angry people, and we had a lot of reason to be angry. The mob was reaching a deafening roar as more and more people joined the fight. Inside, the inspector was doing all he could to keep his officers from firing on the crowd. This was due more for personal safety of the squad than for the rioters. Pine knew that the moment shots were fired, it would be all over for the tiny force inside. Many of those awaiting backup were sure it was over anyway. Village voice reporter Howard Smith, a gay man who was shadowing Pine and copiously taking notes, said of those moments, I was just sure we were going to be killed. Just when it seemed the cops could keep the crowd at bay no longer, the sound of sirens pierced the air. Busloads of the TPF, which stands for Tactical Patrol Force, arrived with helmets and billy clubs. The elite corps was specially trained in handling riots. They were well-trained, calculated, and brutal. 
The officers formed V-shape and began to march toward the crowd, wielding their clubs. This formation protected the policemen from being isolated and more easily targeted. It also allowed them to wipe out large swaths of rioters in a short amount of time. But on this night, the angry queers outsmarted the cops, and rather than breaking apart, as was the formation's intention, the protesters banded together. As they were driven back, they retreated down side streets, circling back to their formation's rear. As soon as the officers had cleared a path, they would look back to see the rioters standing behind them. Yeah, so typically when they had done this in the past, they would just march down the street and they would break everyone up and you'd run. But instead, they would go in groups and they would run around. They kept running around. And they also knew the streets of Greenwich Village better than these people. Yeah, they ran from them down these streets for years. Exactly. And this is so the TPF wasn't, wasn't, uh, it was a general New York force. So it wasn't like they were particularly used to Greenwich Village, mm-hmm. whereas the queers were, and they knew which side streets they could get down, so it was easy for them to run away from the cops, but they didn't stay run away, as the cops were used to. They came back, and they're like, hey, bitches, we're still here. Surprise, surprise, motherfucker. Exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> and just to tease the already flustered cops, the protesters locked arms and formed a car- chorus line singing, we are the village girls, we wear our hairs and curls, we wear our dungarees above our Nelly knees. And I, from what I understand, that is the cro- proper tune. It sounds about right. Yeah. The police were humiliated and furious. They began to up their brutality in an attempt to cover up their embarrassment. One participant observed, Everybody who had a beef in America had already rioted, but the fairies were not supposed to riot. No other group had ever forced the cops to retreat before, so the anger was enormous. I mean, they wanted to kill. I mean, that's all you do. You just just piss off a, co- a bunch of cops that are already, you a know, bunch of, bigoted. A bunch of straight, white, toxic masculine. toxic, masculine cops being as gay as you can, singing a little tune. I can't imagine the In anger. a chorus line of, of gay men getting together and being like, we are the village girls, we wear our hair and curls. <laughs> I can't, Im- oh my God. They they must have been red in the face. I can only oh my imagine God, the losing fury. Their shit. Looking like Trump and shit. <laughs> Somehow throughout the night, no one died. Though countless were injured, there were no fatalities. But by around 4 a.m., the streets had finally calmed, but the atmosphere and energy had changed forever. Martin Boyce, a polyamorous queer man and a 19-year-old participant at Stonewall, said of the following morning, I thought, my God, we're going to pay so desperately for this. There was glass all over, but the next day, we didn't pay. My father called and congratulated me. He said, what took you so long? Once the queer community realized the cops weren't coming to round them all up, the village broke out in a mini pride. There were all... There were open displays of same-sex affection. The chorus line from the night before continued their dance. People marched along yelling, Liberate Christopher Street! And Christopher Street belongs to the Queens! Protests started again, and soon traffic was being blocked. The the TPF was called again, and this time they brought their tear gas with them. Of course they did, because they're stupid motherfuckers. (laughs) The riot started up once more. Trash cans were overturned, more bricks and rubble were thrown at cops, fires were started, and property was damaged. Damaged. Queer individuals were clubbed by police and dragged into wagons. For the next several hours, the riot continued until dying down around 3 a.m. Then over the the following three days, there were more protests, though they were far less violent, by the police and the demonstrators. Not surprisingly, most most newspapers ignored the riot. Those that did cover them... Did so briefly and homophobically. Yeah, and it's it's crazy because, I mean, again, hundreds, if not thousands of people are rioting. A mass amounts of damage is done, and the newspapers won't even cover it because that's how little attention they want it to pay to the queer yep. community. Also, in all the riots, only one person died, and the per- and it was actually, and it is sad because it was actually a man who was stuck in the traffic that was caused by the rioters and he had a heart attack and there uh, wasn't a way for him to get and then and that's where we talk about like sometimes and a, and a year later i finally come to this where sometimes rioting is necessary but never think that only the innocent that only the guilty will be hurt because right. sometimes the innocent this was an innocent taxi driver just doing his job he's caught and he can't no aid is able to get to him right but the community had awakened Organizations, newspapers, and activist groups sprang up overnight. 
The following month, on July 27th, there was an impromptu parade and ceremony organized by Brenda Howard, a proud bisexual Jewish queer woman and member of the kink community. Brenda, Craig, Storm, and other and many other LGBTQ people would later plan the first official Pride March down Christopher Street on June of 1970. Sadly, some planners worked to exclude transgender women, particularly Marsha and Sylvia, despite their huge contribution to the Stonewall riots and to the queer community following the riots. And if you remember in the past, we've talked about Marsha's story, which is in episode four. We talked about Sylvia's story, which is episode 48. And we talk about how they went to the they went to the parade, proud to march, ready to march. Sylvia was supposed to speak. And they said, nope, they, get out of here. You're going to make us look physically bad. pushed them away out of the parade, which Marsha and Sylvia were like, fuck that. We'll just walk in front of the parade. <laughs> which so is they brilliant. actually led the parade. Um, and then they stood in front of Sylvia so that she couldn't get up on the stage, which uh, Sylvia was also like, oh, fuck you, bitch. And she did get up on that goddamn mm-hmm. stage. Sylvia once scaled a wall in heels. So I don't know who thought that they were going to stop her. Yeah. But uh, Sylvia was going to do what she wanted. Exactly. So, but when people come back now, I like the, there is a statue going up in New New York City for Sylvia and Marsha. Mm-hmm. And there's people, of course, because that are mad, right? Well, why don't you put a statue up to other gay heroes? What about Storm? And Storm did a lot. Um, and she was important. She actually would later go on to be very active in the um, the early organizations of uh, of the gay movement. Um, and she and we definitely want to remember her. But the point is that for so long, in recent years, you may hear the names Marsha and Sylvia often. But just know that in the 45 fucking years before that, they weren't mentioned. They were invisible. They were the ones who started everything. Some of the ones who started everything, yeah, and history pretended they did not exist. Sylvia spent the next 20 years after Stonewall on the streets, homeless, struggling with addiction, and the only person there for her was Mar- was Marsha. Yep. And then Marsha was murdered. Her body was dumped in the river, and it was covered up as a suicide yep. or an accidental drowning or whatever spin they with wanted a to hole in to her head. Her. She accidentally drowned. I don't know how that happened. Don't know how the no. hole just happened when she drowned. Just it just miraculously appeared. Mm-hmm. That bullet hole in her head just that's what happens when you fall in the water. So. For, so you could say you can be upset now, but for 50 years, we've had a chance to tell this story right. And only in the last few years have we started to tell it right. So that's why they get the goddamn statue because they were the first ones there because they started the riot and because we didn't remember them for 50 years. So I don't want to hear the shit. I don't want to hear it. Done. Canceled. Next. Over the next 50 years, our community experienced one of the most rapidly progressive progressive civil rights movements in history. But along the way, we left a lot of people behind and we whitewashed our history, as we usually do. Because of this, we are still fighting some of the same battles we fought 50 years ago. In order to properly learn from history, we must properly teach history. And only recently have we started to hear of many of our queer heroes who were pushed aside, some literally pushed aside, in order to advance a more white and heteronormative LGBT agenda. But that was not the foundation of Stonewall and definitely not the foundation of the queer revolution. And I hope as you've listened, you've heard the different people because I tried to make sure that I pointed out the different people. We had a polyamorous man, 19 years old. We had a bisexual member of the kink community who organized the first parade, the impromptu parade and the 1970 parade. We had a lesbian, a butch lesbian. She was very proud of the fact that she was a butch lesbian throwing a punch at the cop. We had transgender women of color standing in the streets, throwing bottles, igniting the crowd. And yes, we had gay men. We had gay men standing there in the chorus line, fighting back against the brutality. But this was a group of mixed queer individuals. This was not one group of queer individuals. And it's only for the longest time, as Evan said, the only ones who have gotten any credit Mm -hmm. are the group of gay men or a single white gay man. Yeah, exactly. And that's not who we are as a community. That's not who we are. And that is not what Stonewall was about. Stonewall was about being able to express yourself. It was about, it was about, it was the place literally where the misfits of the queer community had to go because they couldn't go to the other places. Yeah. It was about every person. There was a gender non-conforming people. It was the non-binary individuals. It was the trans individuals. It was the people of color who were queer. It was the polyamorous folks. It was the kink community. It was all these groups coming together to form the queer community. The queer community is not 
gay white people. The queer community is a beautiful, vibrant community that's all kinds of intersecting identities. All kinds of colors, all kinds of shapes, all kinds of sizes, all kinds of identities. Yeah. And basically anyone who's not a straight white person. Yeah, exactly. The day after the Stonewall incident, the New York Madison Society posted signs in the neighborhood pleading with people not to riot. But as Sylvia Rivera said, we have nothing to lose. And honestly, she didn't. She didn't. Um, the patrons of Stonewall were people on their last thread of hope. People who had nowhere left to go. No more time to wait. No more patience for the daily harassment and injustice. And um, for those who don't know, the Madison Society was basically a bunch of gay white men who could easily hide who they were and probably had at least decent jobs so oh, they were well you know gay yeah white men. so there was nothing for i mean they they had everything to lose and um like they could live their lives normally whereas someone like sylvia rivera who had to hide on or who lived on the streets as homeless yeah. and you know when you looked at her you knew she wasn't normal as yeah. far as you know heteronormative normativity yeah and I, I don't know if I would say the, the gay white men had nothing to lose. No, but they had everything to lose, but they, they could they at easily... They at least had everything. <laughs> yes, they had everything, and they could more easily hide it and pass as heteronormative exactly. than someone like Sylvia Rivera or Marsha P. Johnson. So, of course, they don't want to riot because they don't want to have to expose exactly. themselves. I do I do applaud the gay men like like Harry Hayes and Frank Crimini who came out and, and, and were willing to come out at that time. But again, like you said, it was easy for them to say, now let's just be patient. Yeah. We're going to get there. Uh, no, and and but the rest of the people are like, no, we can't be patient anymore. We're dying. We're, we're being dying. murdered. We're living on the streets. Exactly. These were the people who could not hide in plain sight. The only place they had to hide were the gay bars, and now the police had taken the gay bars away from them. Abusive law enforcement's daily taunting of queers, crazed citizens cutting down the trees in gay parks, bigoted and selfish politicians using the LGBTQ community as nothing more than a pawn in their political games, the mafia blackmailing and bleeding homosexual drives, homosexuals dry. These slights, one after another, broke down a community that needed to break down. We needed to be pushed to the brink of revolution, and we needed our queer siblings to light that flame. We needed those who understood that hiding in the closet was no longer an option, that fighting back was a necessity, and today we need an inner revolution. An understanding that our community is comprised of more than just cisgender white gay men and lesbians. And that's not to say we don't appreciate the contributions of people such as, as Frank Kamini and Barbara Giddings and Harry Hayes and Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. But it is to say that we have remembered those people for over 50 years while only recently have we acknowledged the countless queer people of color and non-gay and lesbian people in our community. Only recently have we confronted our own racism and bigotry within our community. Our elders rioted because they imagined a different world, but have we really let it be that different? Or do we cringe when someone requests they, them pronouns? Do we roll our eyes at the asexuals who come who comes out? Do we get upset when we see kink representative? representatives at pride do we still contribute to buy and trans erasure what beautiful and different world do we really want as we enter into 50 years of pride we challenge you to learn something new about someone new in our community don't stay in your comfort zone be the change we all wish to see and remember that our pride came at a price that while we should certainly have fun and celebrate many of us still have siblings behind us who need our voice and our activism so let us never forget the words that president barack obama stated in his 2013 inaugural address we the people declare today that the most evident of truths that all of us are created equal is the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Seneca Falls and Selma and Stonewall. And that is our episode on Stonewall. We, uh, two-parter. Two-parter. We did a lot of research for this episode, pulled from a lot of resources. Um, again, those links are all on the script. Um, hopefully you appreciate it, or at least you learned something, tried to be as, you know, Try to just, I don't know. To know that pride is more than just a fun thing that comes once a year. Yeah, exactly. Know that it started from a foundation of um, murder and discrimination mm -hmm. and people in our community, all types of people in our community being locked away, being fired, being discriminated against. It's It, it wasn't founded just so we could have a fun party weekend exactly. every year. It was founded as a rebellion 
And with the Trump administration and Mike Pence in office, we need to remember that and continue to fight for equality, not just for, you know, the white gay people. It mm -hmm. needs to be for everyone. And, and I feel like not everyone understands that. Right, exactly. And I'll tell you what, and if you find a young person who says that they're just not that interested in their queer story, um, you need to clap back at that person because we have to understand our history. We are bound to repeat it. And Part of the reason that we continue to repeat it is because we are not bringing people with us because we're not learning from our history. Yeah. We keep saying equality for all, justice for all, but not the trans people. We're going to get to you as soon as we'll, we can. We'll get to you eventually. Oh, we'll get to you. We'll, we'll get to you, I promise. We'll get to you non-binary people. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I think that kink's okay, but if we put that in here, then we might not get the advancement that we want. We keep leaving people behind, so we keep having to fight the same fucking battles over and over again. And I think if over those 50 years, if all people had been brought with, if all people had been raised up, I don't think that today we would be having these issues exactly um, like the transgender military ban because mm -hmm. we would have brought them with and they would have been able to be proud and as outspoken as members of the um, LGB community are. Exactly. We, we, there's so much that we've had to do and repeatedly it happens and, 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 and not just in the gay community, in other communities, right? And, you know, the the black civil rights leaders barred Bayard Rustin from being the leader that he should have been because he was a black gay man, you know. And, and again, and, and like every group feminist openly stood against Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, two lesbians, um, you know, who were active in the feminist community until they were pushed out, you know, or they still were active, but they had to go form their own feminist yep. community because they were lesbians. Like and one group after another constantly does it. If we're fighting for equality for all, then fucking fight for equality for all. That is regardless of religion, regardless of race, regardless of, 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 of background, regardless of orientation, we want to fight for equality for all. So, um, learn your queer story. It's important. Have a wonderful fucking Pride Month. Celebrate yes. and know that you are celebrating the progress that we have made because of the many people who have fallen before you. And if you do want to take on the task of reading a good, comprehensive um, study of the Stonewall Riots, then read David Carter's Stonewall, The Riots That Sparked the Gay Revolution. That's your resource. Your, there are a lot of other resources we use. Definitely check those out. But this is your recommended resource because it, it is the most comprehensive study on Stonewall that is out there. So stay queer. Don't get a lobotomy. We love you, our little allied hookers. And our suckling sapphists. And you proud homocrats. Um, bye. Goodbye. <laughs>